So welcome to uh, this afternoon's conversation with Robert Edgar, who is the founder of DC Central Kitchen as well as LA Kitchen. Uh, I'm Jane Wales, and we're delighted to be joined by the fellows who are part of the uh, uh, American Express Aspen Institute Academy, uh, a remarkable group of nonprofit leaders who we've had the pleasure of spending time with. So I just want to say how grateful we are to the American Express for making this fellowship uh, what it is and making it possible and making it a real pleasure for, poor Rob, for, for both Robert and me. Um, if you are, we are, we're live streaming this conversation, um, and so welcome to the audience across the country. Uh, if you want to tweet about this conversation, uh, first just note that uh, XMX leads, I mean, hashtag MX leads for American Express, at Robert Edgar, which is E-G-G-E-R, or at Jane Wales, W-A-L-E-S. Um, just a sort of quick background, Robert, you, you've started LA Kitchen. Mm -hmm which is brand new, and it's based on the model of DC Central Kitchen. Um, tell us a little bit about the elements of that first, that first enterprise. Well, at first it was, it was a reaction to an experience I had in which as a volunteer, I went out and participated in charity, uh, in that we went out on the streets of Washington, DC, across from the State Department on a rainy night and served a long line of men and women who were outside waiting dutifully as they did night after night for the truck to show up with a different group of volunteers. And at one aspect, I was, I was very nervous. I was uh, you know, kind of a, a recovering hypocrite. Uh, you know, as I say all the time, I, I had talked a lot, a lot about changing the world through music because I ran nightclubs, but the, the, the going out in my own community and really getting face to face with somebody. But I wasn't face to face. I was up in a warm truck serving people in the rain. And I had this moment of clarity where it's like, this is more about the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. Mm -hmm. So at its very core, the DC Central Kitchen was formed to shift that around and, and try and set an equation which, in which everybody was liberated. There's nothing wrong with wanting redemption, just not at the expense of another person. Mm -hmm. So I, just, I wanted to set up that. Um, secondly, I really wanted to show that people who were viewed as part of the problem could be part of the solution. So I was, I was really fixated on the idea of what do we throw away what are our assets? And then how do we realign them so that suddenly people have this, this moment where they're like, I, how did they do that? How did they take food that was going to be thrown away? You know, and that was the, 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 the first thing was restaurants, hotels, hospitals threw away tons of food. Why didn't somebody who get it? But my thing was, okay, we can do that, but why would I pick up food and drop it off and just feed somebody when I can bring it to a kitchen and teach somebody how to cook and shorten that line? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you're a big element of this is a culinary job training program, mm -hmm. in essence, getting how many folks, uh, who, who, who are the demographics, who are uh, part of this training program, and how many of them got full-time jobs? Uh, my bag has always been who's at the bottom. Whoever's at the bottom is who I, I seek to lift up to least to the next rung. So it went from homeless men and women, addicts, com people coming home from prison. Uh, in 1996, with welfare reform, it was moms coming out of homes. Uh, but then it really got into, uh, at least in Washington, returning felons uh, in, the 19, in the early 2000s. That's really where we fixated on this. That was who we were going to serve. But we also started our own businesses to become major employers. Again, my model is constantly adapting. I, I, I embrace fully the idea of, of complete flexibility, always being able to adapt to meet the new set of needs, new, new external forces, if you will, that I think sometimes too many of us in the sector operate in this little box, and we expect every client to fit into our box. And my attitude is, no, our box must constantly be flexible to meet the demands of a very different group of people. So, so it's, it's adults coming out of, uh, they haven't served in prison. Um, what about younger people coming out of difficult situations, foster care? Or well, this is what we're doing in, in LA is, as you said, it's, it's and you know, DC after 25 years, it had produced about 30 million meals and about 700, 1,700 people get full-time jobs. And we had, uh, we had generated about 60% of our own income with our social businesses. We had about 100 people, 140 people on the payroll. Started everybody at 13 an hour with full benefits. Uh, and the majority of managers and staff are people who are home from prison. So LA has taken the same idea, but just a different set of circumstances. I'm very interested in intergenerational. And this time around, the training is for younger men and women aging out of foster care, who statistically, tragically, are on the road towards the street or prison in too many cases. But also I'm interested in older men and women coming home from prison. Um, and the idea of cross mentorship. Can older men and women potentially help deflect younger men and women from that perceived statistical road. 
And can younger men and women help older adapt to a new and changing world? So I'm very interested in that at every angle. Now, uh, we've all read an article uh, in which you're quoted as saying that you're, you're referring to the donated produce on the one hand uh, and the, the older population you serve on the other as uh, wrinkled food, wrinkled people. Um, but, uh, so that caught our attention. Well, wrinkles are the new tattoos. <laughs> So say, say something about, I mean, I'm going to get to the values that underpin this work, but I guess the, the easiest way to ask this is, when you see food, what do you see that others of us might not see? How, what is its connection <coughs> to community? Well, the, uh, to be honest, the last thing I see is, is gas for the body. You know, I, I'm very interested in, we, we sometimes focus on agriculture, and I'm interested in agriculture. You know, what did we leave behind when we left? You know, and it's very important to understand, when, um, at the end of World War II in America, first time in the history of the world an army came home and didn't go back to the farm. And that's when we really left the agriculture. We, be we began a very clear break. And it was an exciting time. But anyway, I'm very interested in the connectivity. What is the, the social contract that was part of the agriculture? As for many flaws that era had, there was a certain connectivity, a certain sense that everybody had a role. And that really interests me because, again, this idea of, Wrinkled, pe wrinkled people, wrinkled food, no waste. That's my whole thing, is all food has power, all people have potential. I just try and reveal each. Mm -hmm. And as you think about, when you think about the values on which this is, is built, and you're talking about people's potential, you've written that you really want folks to um, be empowered and, and, and be able to have independent lives. Yeah. How do you make sure that happens, or how do you advance that objective? Well, you know, again, I, I tend to be somewhat of a, you know, a tactician that you have to have multiple things going on at once. So, you know, at its core, what I try and do in all of my businesses is long ago I realized I couldn't fix anything. It's beyond the scope of charity or any one program to fix things. So I always suggest that I'm not in the nonprofit business. I'm in the, I'm in the bravery business. My job is to make people brave. So whether it's politicians, whether it's donors, whether it's you know, men and women who come in to volunteer, whether it's people who come for services, whether it's our own team. It's that constant sense of inspiring people to see beyond prejudices and stereotypes, beyond their own, self self -limit, their own sense of self-limitation, and see, in effect, you know, uh, the Walden Pond we've been talking about, you know, all day. So that's very much what I try to do, is expose things. One of the reasons I chose LA is because of media there. Um, you know, because again, it's, I, I'm really trying not to expose me or, or the kitchen as much as the idea behind what we do. So for example, one point that I'm, I'm mesmerized on is, is right now in Los Angeles, there are millions of dollars in contracts for senior meals, right? And that's, I want that business um, because it'll sustain our organization, allow me to hire people. But it also, I'm selling to mayors across America. Look, this is a contract in which historically LA and every other city would get, in effect, processed meals and profit would be exported from town and never come back. What I'm trying to say is look at this. I'm gonna buy from local farmers. I'm gonna keep people out of prison, which has its own economies. Um, I'm gonna create healthier meals, which will keep people out of hospitals. I'll engage the public in the process through volunteerism. I'll train people for jobs, I'll employ people. But more importantly, profit will never leave LA. I will reinvest over and over. So what I'm hoping to do is, is use our program as a Trojan horse. And I, all my businesses are Trojan horses. You sometimes have to trick people into opening the, the mental gates. Um, so the, the, the kitchen is, a, is a designed to attract people so that I can expose them to more radical ideas that they might not want to hear about if I just said, in fact, called up and said, hey, you want to talk about economic opportunity or racial justice in America. Sometimes we have to understand Americans are decent, fundamentally decent people, but they, they operate majority of them out of a place of fear. I get that, hence the courage business. Uh, but that idea of, of helping people overcome those fears to see larger opportunities. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, hang on to the word stereotype, which you, you mentioned about a minute ago. Um, we're in this conversation in part about the relationship of the nonprofit community, not only to its beneficiaries, but also to its donors. Um, and, and, the, and a worry that has emerged is, is there a narrative, is there a story that needs to be told in order to inspire people to give that is actually 
I mean, leading to a stereotype, it un you know, uh, oh, yeah. inaccurate, unfair, it's, uh, you know, somehow false, that story. Talk about what, what those stereotypes might be that we should be uh, doing everything to avoid. Well, I, it, for, for too often, I think, for a lot of sad reasons, we sell pity. You know, we sell there, but for the grace of God, God, we sell redemption. Mm -hmm. um, we don't sell justice. We don't sell equality. Because those are, there's no money there. And instead of the bravery sometimes it takes in our own organizations, our own leadership, to maybe challenge some of those ideas and some of those funders. You know, I think one of the stories that's missing is the story of us as a sector. We are uniquely, we, I think we are the best of America. We, we exemplify what's great about this country to a certain extent. I mean, for, for most people who work in the nonprofit sector, we people, we're people who refuse to submit to the idea that all people aren't equal, that all people don't have something to contribute. You know, uh, what I hate is to see you know, arts being pitted against AIDS, you know, or, or uh, that, that we're forced to fight each other for scraps. Um, so I think that, that our story, this idea that, you know, de Tocqueville marveled about it, um, you know, we've codified it in our tax system. You know, we've asked an entire generation, the millennials, to do service, to graduate high school. Uh, we are the third biggest employer in America. We are one-tenth of the American economy. We hold three trillion in assets. We have a hundred billion in annual revenue with 14 million employees, and in California alone, nonprofits bring $40 billion in from outside the state in. We are dynamic job creators. So we haven't learned how to own that yet, let alone translate it into some kind of a social or political agenda. Yep, and I should say the Aspen Institute has been working with a variety of nonprofit data, uh, data aggregators to ensure that this kind of data is open so that policymakers understand uh, the, uh, the role in our economy of the nonprofit We're the sector. ace, the ace in the deck. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, I, again, I, I think that one of the, I, I found it shocking, for example. Um, I did a lot of work in New Hampshire and, uh, in, in 2006, 2007, really trying to get, at the time, what was a great horse race of, of candidates, for them to acknowledge our role. Because, again, think about it. There wasn't one candidate. And in the last election, neither President Obama, who got his first job at a nonprofit, nor Governor Romney, neither one mentioned nonprofits or philanthropy, not once that I know of. And here we are, the third biggest employer in America. And I just, I'm shocked by that. Yeah. And you're trying to change that. You, you have not shied away from advocacy one bit. Well, because at the end of the day, I, I, I represent probably one of the greatest paradoxes or ironies. I mean, I came up in an era where I was, trying, I was reacting and I built the, the DC Central Kitchen to do what I thought was a, a small stab at justice, right? And I worked hard, as did many of my generational peers, to make the, the, the business vital and, and efficient. And, and you could, to a certain extent, you could say we succeeded. I, I believe firmly that the DC Central Kitchen remains one of the most efficient and effective nonprofits in America. Yet at the end of the day, what do we do? We feed leftover food to poor people. And that's fucked up, pardon, you know, I mean, the reality is that can't be, that can't be the norm. That can't be celebrated. So the thing is, you have to use this as a means to something bigger. And sadly, for anybody who, who, whose eyes are open, you have to follow where it leads. And, and I think it leads to policy and politics. Mm -hmm. And this is where, to a certain extent, nonprofits have, have been told, you dare not tread. This is illegal for you, that you, we will come and take your 501c3 away from you. Well, you've been concerned about grant agreements that in essence say none of this grant can be used for advocacy purposes. I think it's a betrayal to our legacy. You know, we have on the walls of many of our offices leaders who risk death, imprisonment, um, you know, grinding debt because they didn't make any money, the inability to send their kids to school because they believed in something. And their pictures adorn our offices. Yet, every time we, send, so we sign a grant agreement, and I've done it too, that says, I won't do advocacy, they must, you can almost hear a, 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 a sigh, you know, from those leaders who were like, how can you do that? You know, because you, I believe we in the sector have a sacred trust, man. We're the guardians of this really amazing thing about America, the promise of America. I think we're the ones who hold that. Right, and, 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 then, and of course you've decided to have both a non nonprofit and uh, a social business uh, combined. But you've written in your book, you have a wonderful book called Begging for Change, with both meanings of change. 
Um, and in that book, you've said something to the effect that, <coughs> excuse me for paraphrasing, but to the effect that if we're expected to act like businesses, we need to be funded like businesses, where you don't, what your, most of your, uh, your investment dollars right. as well as your revenues are not tied to specific programmatic uh, activities. Say something about how we can move from here to there. Well, I'm very interested in what I believe, and I've written about what I think is the, the gender origins of modern philanthropy, and ergo, the kind of sexist bondage that is the grant system. You know, in other words, you don't get funded if you do advocacy or you really talk about larger, more profound issues that will actually diminish the need for traditional charities. There's no money for that. And I find that very, very tough. So access to capital is a big part of what we do. You know, so I was lucky enough when I went to Los Angeles, the nonprofit finance fund, along with the California Community Foundation, arranged for us to have a $2 million PR loan, program related investment loan. So I think that not only am I trying to build something very powerful, but at the same time I feel like I'm holding water for a new form of capital that would give a lot more nonprofits that want to explore transitioning from service to empowerment the options, the opportunities that, that I've had, you know, to get access to capital or a line of credit. You can't do business without being able to manage debt. That's, I, I think this is what most people don't get. It's not just getting checks in. You have to be able to float debt and manage it and pay it back in order to get more. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to another sort of piece of the narrative or the story um, we tell in conversations back and forth of, between grantors and grantees is invariably you're, or frequently you're being pressed by uh, the grantor to go to scale. And the whole question, how can this be scaled? How can this, so uh, are there times when being decidedly local is really the right way and scaling doesn't make sense? Oh yeah. I've, I've I'm not a big believer in scale. I think it's folly in many respects. Now, I get, I get it. To a certain extent, what we're trying to do is take big, audacious ideas to the point where they have larger impact. But I, I think it's, I, I believe actually the first generation of social enterprise was somewhat um, stifled in its growth because what you had is a generation of people who were really interested in building, as I like to say, their own individual cathedral versus selling a more liberating faith. I'm mesmerized by what I think is, is social enterprise to me represents economic Buddhism. It's this middle path between .com, .org. It gets the best of both. And it really should be, most mayors in America should be pounding the table saying, I want social enterprise. They should be actually hunting for nonprofit partners to say, do you need capital? Let me help you get that. Because if I help you build your business, profit won't leave town. This should be the battle cry for every mayor in America. Keep and, the profit local. And we have seen some mayors who really are attuned to that. I, I would say Mayor Blumen, uh, Bloomberg in New York had a, a, a profound understanding of both the nonprofit sector and, and the world of social enterprise. So there are others like that. Is that spreading? There are. As an Not as fast as it needs to. Again, I, I've actually been kind of shocked by it. And again, I've, I've worked hard to elevate this issue. But uh, for example, I know Governor Hickenlooper was here. When he was mayor, he opened up what I think was one of the very first offices of strategic partnership. And a very small handful of people, led by Desa West, went and brought almost $50 million in new money into the city just by helping nonprofits partner to go after grants. Now, if I'm, an, if I'm a mayor in Colorado Springs or, or any of these other towns or anywhere in America, I'm like saying, get me a small staff. If, if three people can bring in $50 million, get me three people quick. So it should have been one of those great moments. So I, I think, unfortunately, very few people have, but this is sadly, uh, for, for at least from my donor's point of view sometimes, I've spent a huge amount of my time on this issue. And in fact, just so you know, man, my, my leadership is 49-51. 49% is how do I make the business I do, the LA Kitchen, stronger, efficient, better, but 51 is how, I, how do I strangle this, how do I move away past this? You know, I, and I, if you flip and it becomes 51, keep the machine alive, you become a servant, you know? And I just, I, I, I'm much more interested in being a leader. You, you've actually wrote in your book that nonprofits are structured often more for survival than for efficacy. So, it, has that changed no. since your book was written? What, what is it that worried you? And you, I should also add that you say something to the effect that if we had 24% fewer nonprofits, we might be better off. So, say well, about I, I do believe we're a saturated market, and that's a, another, because we don't have as many of the market forces, if you will. But uh, you know, I'm much more interested, in, and this is going to get provocative here, but um, I think that Milton Friedman should be stricken from the books. I think Milton Friedman and the notion, which is, I think, flawed at so many levels that the number one goal of a business is to export as much, squeeze as much profit for the investors. I think that is a, a very foul way of thinking. Um, so I'm very interested in a new way. Now, in effect, modern philanthropy is still based on the same construct, which is Carnegie Rockefeller, which is 
Make as much money as you can by any means necessary, and near the end of your life, give some back to offset the damage you did, making all the money you could <laughs> by any means necessary. And sadly, Bill Gates and God bless Warren Buffett, but they're still pushing this idea of make a bunch and then give it back. The future of philanthropy is how you spend your money every day, not how much you give at the end of the year or the end of your life. Mark my words, this is what differentiates this generation. And one of the reasons I run at any opportunity to speak to young leaders is the idea of one of the greatest failures I've ever seen has been my generation's version of success. You know, and that, that the need to fundamentally look within your own journey about what kind of leader you want to be. How will you measure success? How will you measure happiness? Because if you look to the external world, it's going to be get more stuff. And that's what creates, in my opinion at least, the, the damage, the wreckage that we have to follow with our brooms behind the parade. Are you watching, are we watching uh, the world of business changing radically in that regard? And in fact, the world of business schools changing radically in that regard, in part because in the first instance, the employers, the employees are asking for it. They say, we want purpose out of our work. And in the case of business schools, the students are asking. Yes, for it. and that's, this is dramatic, but none will have more profound effect as what I believe is the, the rapidly rising revolt of the consumers. You know, the economy has been, a, we've been a consumption-driven economy. Very soon I want to see us to be a consumer-powered economy. You know, one of my favorite bands of my youth in D.C. is a band called Fugazi. And there's a great lyric, man, you know, it isn't what they're selling, it's what we're buying. And I think this is what, do this very quick, but when you look at Gandhi, who took salt, table salt, you know, to get the British to the negotiating table. Dr. King took the dimes it took to ride a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Cesar Chavez took the table grape. You know, three of the most powerful revolutions that we witnessed or read about were driven by poor people's pennies and the idea of standing together. Now, they used the boycott, you know, and I get it. I get it. And it, it, it proved to be a powerful tool. But I'm more interested in the next phase of it, which I call the boycott, you know, which is, in effect, how do you reward and incentivize behavior versus punish? And I think once consumers realize we've always had that power, make no mistakes, brothers and sisters, Sometimes when people are leaders that are really dangerous, we kill them and we make them saints. You know, study, the, they were flawed men and flawed women, but they were daring tacticians. Study tactics and economics. And this is what interests me. I think ultimately down the road, particularly with, new, with so many amazing apps, we have the ability to know when I buy something, can I look at that barcode and determine where that money goes politically? Can I, can I really use my daily purchasing power is the ultimate form of volunteerism and philanthropy. That's the future. Well, and there's, there's, there's that, and there's also, a, 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 I think, a greatly increased understanding that with these long global supply chains and the, you know, the distance between uh, the company that's selling you, you know, the producer and, and, their, uh, and the workers that are producing the product, that we're finding there is, in fact, forced labor. Yeah. Uh, slavery. Um, and, and you're seeing companies coming together with policymakers and with NGOs like Verite to do supply chain audits, ferret out that problem, and shut down suppliers with slaves. Uh, so we're, we're, it, it feels like a very different world than the world when you and I were coming up. Oh, for sure. Uh, and think about, I mean, again, when you and I were coming up, insurrection, you, you, you went to the highest tower, the minaret, and you yell, death to the king. And they, you yell as long as, until they, they, they drag you down. Now you can be in a dark cellar saying, death to the king, tweet. You know? <laughs> no, that's power. That's power. You know, one of the things that's so important is your generation, globally, it's, 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 un, it's unfathomable, the size and the connectivity of this generation. You all are already in power and you don't know it. You know, I said this so many times, man, don't occupy the street, take over the town. You know, numbers alone, you're already in charge. So while I, I, I really dig and, and I'm amazed by the power of an iPhone, you know, the question becomes, you know, years ago, I, I had a friend of mine once said to me young, when I was very young, but he said, man, you got two choices. You can be an agent of the people or a tool of the man. So sometimes I look at iPhones and it's like, how are you going to use your iPhone? You know, is it going to be an agent of the people or a tool of the man? So you, in this book, uh, Begging for Change, you have some fairly harsh criticism of the nonprofit sector, um, yet you say that 
the nonprofit se sector should roar and yet we purr. What do you mean by that? And what is your advice to these remarkable nonprofit leaders in the room with respect to roaring versus pur purring? Well, you know, A, I wrote, I wrote begging, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago. And I was, it was a different time and, and I was blaming the players when I really, I, I subsequently learned it was the game. So immediately once I realized that I had, I had really challenged the sector for things that were beyond it, its control. And again, this is what led me on the journey of gender and whatnot. And I said this so many times, but this is why I went and got this little heart on my finger to avoid doing this you know, anymore. Because I did that. Begging for Change was one of those books where it was like, I was, I was angry because I felt the sector had abdicated its responsibility. When I really only learned later that we're, we've never had the tools to do that. Um, but I do believe firmly, fervently in the destiny of the nonprofit sector. And I think it's intergenerational. I, 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 know, I know it sounds preposterous, but I believe you know, every single morning in America, 10,000 people wake up 69, every single morning. A generation who heard with their own ears, man, Robert Kennedy, Barbara Jordan, Marvin Gaye, you know, and, and, and they look in the mirror and I think many of them sigh and wonder how they got so lost. And I see them every day coming back. And this is one of the reasons I've chosen to work with older people now. A, they're the next ones at the bottom, but it's an amazing generation that can be redeemed. And I believe that there is amazing cross purpose that we've been told generations should, that we've been pitted against one another. But the reality is there's really powerful unifying moments. This is what I started doing in the nonprofit sector is find what are the unifying principles that would have an Aspen Institute and the little homeless shelter realize we're in the same game together. Similarly, what are the unifying principles for older and younger? And I think nutrition, food access, clear labeling, we could have a really powerful political um, partnership between us. So there's things that I think, I think there's tools available now that give young nonprofit leaders incredible power. But ultimately, ultimately I believe our great destiny is to confront the notion that we can't be engaged in the political process. That in effect, we must be silent and watch from the sidelines while the decisions are made that really affect the people we care about, the causes we work towards and the communities we serve. Of course, this is back to the theme of community and a democracy. When you think how unnatural it, it, it is to separate the generations, and yet we do. Totally. Uh, and you're countering that. I want to open this up to questions and I'd comments love it. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. Don't, don't feel you need a question mark at the end of what you say. We've had the pleasure of being flies on the wall as these um, American Express Aspen Institute fellows have been having a really profound, in my view, conversation. I've learned a lot. So share it with the rest of uh, our audience. And um, there's a, a microphone there. Do say your name first. Um, and let's see some hands. Right on. Hi, my name is Chris Al. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris. Uh, you said, something you said really struck me. You said, don't be a, be an agent of change, not a tool of a man. Can you give me an, can you give me an example of what you mean by that? Well, you know, Gandhi, uh, we can't all be Gandhis, you know, and in fact, again, the sainthood stuff makes us think I could never do that. We all can't. We all have this power within us. But I'm very interested because he once said, you know, every act. And I think for most people, it's like, dude, come on, every act? You know, but I am really interested in that. It's not necessarily a dogma as much as it's a frame of thinking. You know, it's this idea that am I making a decision because I'm really, because it, I, I'm, I'm conditioned to say I believe in this? You know, in a way, it's just trying to really force, and I, these are things I do for myself. And just so you know, man, as, as young leaders, you know, the journey of leadership is, a, is constant self-evaluation, not navel-gazing, but, you know, really, am I doing this for the right reasons? Is it because I want my organization to thrive based on my ego? Or am I really, truly doing this because I believe fundamentally in this, this larger, greater truth? And it can be very easy to get um, distracted. I, I wear a ring. You can tell I'm surrounded by things that remind me of who I want to be, but I wear a ring with Coca Pelli, the trickster, you know, and it's, it's the sirens from Greek mythology. You know, it's easy to be lured off your path. Um, so uh, it's, it's a constant attempt for me to keep my, my, my compass needle pointed relatively north so that I know I'm, I'm still on the journey. I hope that was relatively yes. good. Thank you. And yes, we'll start with Blair, then we'll go right behind and Hi. then uh, to Blake McKinley. And yeah, I'm really curious at how you're saying, um, you know, the, the point of business is which we've all taken to be a given is to squeeze out profit. And you know the realities we live in is a process of or is a product of how we think. And so the social enterprise movement, 
um, that there is a balance between profit and social good. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it, but as I look going forward, how do we prevent it from being a sham? How do we prevent it from being a nice word where businesses are actually still being motivated by that profit motive and not achieving that social goal? You know, I'm very interested in this because, you know, sometimes when you study independence movements, you realize that they don't turn out great. You know, we were talking a little about India. I mean, it was this glorious moment, yet, you know, the, the friction between India and Pakistan was, was horrific. You know, and, and oftentimes, you know, it, it's, and that's why I go to 4951. I'm, I'm with you, man, but 49% is my own personal decisions about how I run my business or how I share leadership within the business, how we price our products, all those things, because I want to make sure that our business reflects what I believe is a, is a I don't want to say pure, but, you know, a real decent attempt to be a really cool business. But you can't operate in that vacuum. 51 must be percent, this, this larger sense of how do I help social enterprise again? not fall into um, just become an, another buzzword or, or being hijacked by the man metaphorically. You know, because again, anything that becomes popular becomes dangerous and then it becomes how do I hijack it and sanitize it and sell it back as entertainment. So I'm very interested in this idea of you know, how do we as a movement keep this? And this is why I'm so fixated on enlightened consumption because I think globally your generation represents a generation that doesn't have the resources to give to charity like your parents and grandparents does. And that's going to fundamentally change nonprofits globally. You know, the era of extra that birthed the nonprofit sector, the post-war economic bubble that sadly we in America came to believe is, is the norm, it was a blip in the history of the world, man, where we rebuilt and fed the globe. And now everyone's caught up and everybody wants their slice. So the whole sector is about to be, whether they know it or not, there's a huge change coming. So really, from enlightened self-interest, the large, the, 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 if I'm either a donor, if I'm a mayor, if I'm a nonprofit leader, the smartest money is, I believe, this idea of social enterprise, this idea that you can mitigate certain things, still get goods and services sold, but you get this idea of, of the economy, the local economy thrives. But in many ways, aren't we in a transition now? And I, I think Blake's pointing to a, um, a, a, an inflection point where, where some things could, could go quite badly, right? But, but every day, I mean, that's the wild so, thing about our segment. Every day is an inflection point, you know? It could all go south tomorrow. The, the question becomes, dude, young brother, man, how will you lead your life? You know, it's a personal decision you make every day when you wake up. You know, am I going to be, you know, am I going to talk or am I going to act? So I'm you know. going to ask you, we're going to turn to these next two questions, but to ask you to, um, in, in answering them, help us understand what the relationship to the beneficiary needs to be. You know, is, is the beneficiary in, in, in the design phase? And I'm talking about not just nonprofits, but in particular in social enterprises, in businesses that are intended to produce produce both the financial and social return. But let's, uh, let's have Ellie have a chance, or well, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren could go first. Thanks, so, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. So From since we're all, got it. <laughs> since we're all kind of in the beginning, I'm curious to know when did you know to transition from DC to LA? Because <laughs> we need to maybe have some guideposts as to when we should transition out. It's a personal decision, but honestly, I felt two things in in, in DC Central Kitchen, and as well as in the broader service construct. We tell poor people how to act all the time. You know, addicts, you know, give up that addiction, go do this. We're constantly telling people how to change their lives. Yet we as nonprofits don't do the same things we preach. You know, don't panhandle. What do we do? We panhandle. <laughs> you know, so I became very intrigued on maybe, again, I, the, the worst word I hate is hypocrite. You know, I, I, that, that would sting me deep. So that idea of, of not wanting to be that, you know, not wanting to become, I, you know, as I love to say, man, nobody wakes up when they're 21 and says, man, when I grow up, I want to be a boring nonprofit leader that stifles innovation, you know? <laughs> Yet the sector's full of them. So how does that happen? How does somebody fiery and young become that? And I never wanted to be that, you know? I don't want to stay young as much as I want to hold on tight to the dreams and aspiration of my youth. So there's that sense of, again, constantly that, that sense of, am I participating in something or am I, you know? But so there was a sense of, wanted to do what I preached. But at the same time, I talk a lot about leadership, and I thought it was very imperative for our sector to see a founder split. You know? Now, at the same time, I'm, I was 55 at the time, and there was a great sense of, if I'm gonna split, it better be now. You know? uh, and, and in fact, I had also done a very good job of creating what I felt was a very healthy organization with diversified leadership and a good funding base and social enterprise. 
There's an old Keith Richards song, man, you better walk before they make you run. You know, so it was, it was a good time to tag out. But I also knew that my own journey was taking me in a new direction because I, I tend to be an amateur futurist. You know, and this is just probability and trends. And about 10 years ago, I really started thinking big time because I knew that the food that the nonprofit sector, rely, my, my business, relies upon, it's all lost profit. And inevitably, industry will figure out, and we're part of helping industry figure out, in, because the more we become efficient, we give receipts, we tell them, we literally tell them where the holes are in their system. So in theory, less food's gonna come in. But I also became aware of aging in America um, and the fact that you were gonna have a real spike in demand as a generation began to hit who didn't have enough money in the bank for the extra 10 or 15 years science was gonna give them. So I saw the future in the early 2000s as supply and demand. And I really realized, and there's three kinds of leaders, brothers and sisters, really get your head around this. The vast majority of the nonprofit sector, God bless them, I totally get it, head down, head down. I can't look up, I gotta make payroll. I gotta keep lights on. And I get that, I totally respect that. The second kind of leader are you. You know, you get a momentary pause where you can lift your head up and you can see things coming and you see the future coming. Now, of that, the majority wait for the future to come to them and they brace, you know? Situate, think about me. In 2000, like I said, oh man, all those old people are coming. Oh, that's gonna be bad. You know, but it's like the third kind of leader, and I know that's the kind that our friends at hashtag MX Leads brings to the table. <laughs> They're the people who say, man, fuck that. I'm marching out to meet the future. I refuse to submit. That could be bad. I could get beat up, but I cannot let it happen. And that's the audacious form of leadership that I aspire to. But that idea, I had, I had to march out to LA because this represents a place for me, at least in my business model, I have an unlimited supply of amazing food. You know, we throw away 40% of the food we produce, but half of it's fruits and vegetables. So by positioning myself there, I had a good supply chain of both free, but also purchased for my social enterprise. It's the largest concentration of older people living in poverty in America. But man, guess what? It's also the epicenter of the youth culture. What better place to uptarn the apple cart, you know, than to go into the temple of youth and say, man, there's, old, there's gold in old, you know? Um, but that idea of, of positioning myself in that place purposely. So it, people used to say to me all the time, dude, you're always on the road. And it's like, no, dude, I'm on a mission. The mission takes me to the road. So Ellie, and then come over here. You go ahead, Ellie. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks so much for being here and sharing your perspective with totally us honored. and your work. Um, so I'm hearing a couple of things, and I kind of just, I know we've been talking through a lot of like what our roles mean as leaders in the sector and sort of where we want to go next. So I'd be curious what your advice is on, you know, next steps for each of us to come away with. Um, because I feel like I'm hearing, you know, that we need to consider more roaring, more advocacy, and then also hearing a lot about um, how we come up against, you know, in your words, the sexist bondage of the grant system. Um, and I see, I know there's a couple pathways probably for achieving that, but I'm kind of curious what your take is for us. Like, what should we walk away with? Well, hey, roaring doesn't mean yelling. <laughs> and it's not belligerence, you know? I'm a tactician. You can, you can beat your head against the front door of the, of the castle, or you can use your brain to dismantle it. You know, and too often we think our job is to be against something. I want to be for something. You know, so I, I try and propose alternate ways of thinking and then prove they work. You know, again, a lot of what I do is just by design to say, look, most people think felons are, are, are you know, throw away the key, you know, or old people, you know, all these things. So I just try and reveal what's there. Uh, but, you know, I go back to this, man, is, is, you know, everybody's journey, the road splits. I mean, mine, I ran nightclubs. I could never in a million years predict that I would do this for a living. You know, but we all have those moments where suddenly the road splits and there's no signposts that say polka dots and moonbeams, I'd turn back if I were you. You just, it's, it's the leap of faith, you know? And what you find is once you go down this road, man, you're constantly leaping, you know? I mean, dude, I put it all on the line. Don't you love how I speak California speak now? You know? um, but In no, particularly I put it, Southern I put it California all speak. on the line. I mean, I, I, I cashed out of DC and I, I put all the chips in. Man, it was, it's, they're, they're, I mean, I'm 50, I was 55, I'm 57 now, man. I had, you know, I've made payroll for 27 years. I've never missed a payroll. And, you know, I had sleepless nights of, of that idea of this could all crash. But, you know, again, it's, it's Hunter S. Thompson. You know, I'd rather be shot out of a cannon than squeezed out of a tube. You know, so that, that sense of I'm, I'm constantly going to go on the cannon. But again, I, I urge you, as we've talked about earlier, ultimately you have to decide what kind of a leader, what kind of person you want to be. You know, I went back to my 
fifth year high school reunion, 10th year. And my friends were like, dude, you still doing that homeless thing? And it's like, that's, that's what I do. You know, that, that's, my, that's what I do. 20 years, 25 years later, you know what? People were saying, dude, I wish I'd done what you did. You know, and I think there's a real currency. As much as it's hard to spend, there's a currency to what we do that I think more and more and more people look at and say, I wish I could find a way to do that. This is what I look at when I see the boomers coming, is an army of people who are like saying, you know, there's, I want to be part of something again. I don't want to bowl alone anymore. You know, and that's a powerful tool, man. So I think there's an army of people who really want to tribe up. I tell people constantly, I'm sorry, I just, the food movement is really more about tribing up than it is about food. And don't you think, feel that this next generation is remarkably purpose-driven and inventive in finding the ways to have a life of purpose? Well, you know, it's funny, man. You think about it. We've raised your generation doing service. So is it any wonder sometimes that you've been inside, if you will, the belly of the beast of charity, and you didn't like what you saw? We should actually, as, as leaders, we should be turning constantly to young people and old, whoever comes in. You got a new idea? I'm open to anything. You know, I've always embraced a by any means necessary culture. Um, and so that idea, again, never forget, I was a volunteer who came up with an idea. All I wanted to do was help. And I was told, it's okay, we, you know, it won't work. And I was shocked, you know. So actually, we put up uh, in D.C., and I'll have it in L.A., a volunteer bill of rights, saying you have the right to tell me what you think. You have the right to talk to anybody here in this organization. You have the right to our financial information. You have the right to rate your experience. You have the right to be engaged no matter your physical limitations. You have the right to be treated with respect, and you have a right to know what impact you made in the community today. You know, I want people to challenge us. Hi, Robert. Hi. I'm Christina uh, from Chicago. And, well, first, let me just start by saying that I thank you so much for your refreshing words. Um, I think it's just not and every you just day. just like F-bombs. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for keeping it real and being truly genuine. I really, really appreciate that. Um, you started off by saying, uh, by admitting to yourself, right, and self being self-critical and saying that you are a recovering um, hypocrite. hypocrite. Right, so that really set the tone. I'm a tone, recovering right? white dude. Yeah, that, 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 that's and what we can, set We'll the go down tone. that trail if yeah. you want, but keep going. I, so my, and then you also talked about how many Americans, most Americans operate from a place of fear. And it's that same fear, I believe, you know, going back to some of our discussions throughout the course of this week, that prevents us from really challenging the status quo, challenging our funders to sort of look at things differently, et cetera, right? And even to get outside of our brains to even conceive that there's another model out there that we could, you know, look to, right? You also sort of said you totally denounced Friedman, right? Which, who does that in public? So thank you for that, right? <laughs> I mean, I think we're so sort of wedded to those that, old ideologies and you know the Adam Smiths of the world and it's like that's all we know that we're so scared right fearful to walk away from that because what is the other person going to think of us you know I use the I said earlier this week that everyone's so scared of us even floating the the idea or the thought that we could be considered socialists in some way right by doing things like this um so what advice would you have for sort of a group like ourselves, right, that are in those roles sort of that we're trying to push the envelope, right, but we're sort of still kind of not there yet, right? Like what advice could we take to ordinary Amer or wh how could we engage in a, in a constructive dialogue with ordinary Americans that could help us have the language to transmit some of these things without scaring <laughs> away? Right, the, the same people we're trying to attract uh, to our causes. Right, no man, I'm mesmerized by this, by this conversation. Because, you know, again, that idea of, of meeting people where they're at. You know, I've done it with food most of my career. If you want to go into a school or a senior center and introduce healthy food, first question, what do you like? And we'll work on that, you know, so it's familiar. So I'm always intrigued by meeting people where they're at, by just respecting that, that Boy, your, your, your ideas might be very difficult for me to understand, but I, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and think that you're coming from a place of fear. I'm not going to basically tell you that, but, but you know, I'm just going to try and respect that people have their opinions. Um, but at the same time, man, for your generation, it's, it's be respectful, but don't be patient. You know, I mean, when you look at the civil rights movement, we want to think it was a homogenous thing, right? But you had the um, NAACP with a, with a, uh, a legal agenda 
you know, that they were going to challenge laws. Then you had this kind of organic thing that happened with Dr. King and the Southern Christian leadership, you know, that was somewhat organic, and there was friction there. You know, there's a sense of, like, an uneasy peace, but you know what happened? College kids, man, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, said, you all are all taking too much time, and they started the Freedom Rides. So, and again, I, I must admit, it, it's, um, I, I was mesmerized by those two young women um, from Black Lives Matter um, in Seattle. Because the reality is, man, you know, again, I dig Bernie, but Bernie was tardy, you know, on coming up with something really profoundly important to, to amplify his economic message with a social justice mission. They made that happen. You know, so there's, that, there's, the, there's the time to be respectful, and then there's a the time to be impatient. You know, I just, it, we were talking about roaring. There, there is a time for loud. There's a time for clever. You know, there's a time for... Um, and I think one of the most important things is compromise. You know, sometimes we were, read, we were raised to think it's, it's black and white, and you realize there's gray. Sometimes older leaders get lost in the gray. You know, I still like black and white, but I understand the power of gray. Um, so, but, you know, just so you know, man, I, I'm, I'm, if you're interested, and it is, it's insanely, I mean, I'm 57, so the fact that young people still want to hear what I have to say is really, it's an honor for me to be asked. <laughs> Seriously. Um, because I really, I, a lot of my own, my compass needle, is derived by my proximity to you all. You know, because you, you have the power to keep people like me who want to stay honest, honest. So I really, I, I'm very respectful of that. And I'm always open, if anybody wants to have a conversation, um, I'm easy to find. I'm R. Egger at LA Kitchen. I'll, I'll talk to anybody anytime. I'm, I'm, I was told by too many leaders when I came in the sector, I don't have time or no. And I will never ever say no. I, 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 and if I can give you any life lesson, man, the, the amazing power of yes. You'd be amazed how many doors fly open when you're open. So we're going to turn to Christina. Hi, Christy from Oakland, California. Um, Robert, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, in talking about change and you're talking about um, these themes around how to question the status quo, you said most mayors of America should be asking for social profit, that this should be part of the battle cry. Why aren't they and how do we help make that part of the battle cry? And right after this, let's, let's turn to Veronica and Arturo. Sadly, I, we have kind of Just an Veronica. economic bifurcated lens. Dot coms drive the economy. And, and if I may get into my gender thing, dot com masculine. Dot orgs nurturing feminine do good deeds. And unfortunately, that's the way we bifurcate our lens. So most mayors come in and think economic stability is going to be brought through the dot com side. And sadly, they think it's going to be derived from something big, scale. I have to have the biggest convention center, I have to have the biggest stadium, I have to have the biggest grocery store. Um, and they chase, and, and again, what we've seen constantly is, you know, we end up s spending so much money to attract some, a company that then takes as much as they can, and then at six days later, they go to another town. And I think this just happens. So what's happening, sadly, is, is we haven't yet ushered in a new generation that isn't burdened by that bifurcated construct. And so this is why I think the first generation of social enterprise, and this, one of the reasons I chose Los Angeles is because of the media there, you know, and I really wanted to try and carry a torch for the idea of social enterprise, not mine, you know, but what I say constantly is I am one of many, you know, and again, I always say there's a difference. If I, if I came here and all I did was talk about the LA kitchen, then I'm a salesperson, and I might have a superior product, but that's what I am, and no disrespect, salespeople are needed. I'm a social entrepreneur. I use my business to sell the larger idea. And I think that's a very radical concept. It's 49.51. Um, I had to get a tattoo that says that, man. The night is young. Let's go out tonight, man. Everybody. But I mean, again, that's the idea of is it, is it me or is it us? And I'm a firm believer in us. Veronica. Hi, Robert. I'm Veronica. Thank you so much for your uh, truly inspirational and motivational words. Um, I have two questions. The first. Um, you know, I applaud your, I, your notion of constantly being forward thinking. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the other traps that you see that limit us from doing that um, and what the greatest opportunities are? Um, second question is, we talked a lot today about giving a voice to those who we serve. How do you see the best opportunity and the right way for us to do that? Wow, so many great questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to take it on a provocative uh, thing here because, you know, your first question, you know, um, when it comes to personal journey, 
over the years, people have, on, a, on occasion, people understandably say, what was hard about opening the DC Central Kitchen? And it's very important that, that anytime I talk, if I have the opportunity, I'll say, in effect, I'm a white dude in America. You know, let's, what's hard for me? I have been given advantages. When I called the Republican White House in 1988 saying, hey, George Bush is going to be inaugurated, and I'd like to come and pick up food from the inauguration to launch my new business. We opened up on George Bush Sr.'s inauguration. I have a white voice. Would I have gotten the same? Would somebody have said yes if I had a different voice? Most likely, yes. They would have said, no, sorry, not interested. The, I mean, the, the countless things. And that's given me countless ability to think. I mean, think about it. You know, now, again, there was a, a lot of circumstances, but at the end of the day, I've had the luxuries very few leaders have. And, and one, of the, one of the greatest, and it, and it speaks to the, the issue of so many of the people we serve is time. You know, most nonprofit leaders, all they have to do, they're chasing money relentlessly. You know, I was based in Washington, D.C. You know, I opened up, uh, I worked out of a shelter right below the capital of the United States when cable television came about. You know, I opened the kitchen before the internet or cable television. So cable television, who could resist the image of the Capitol Dome and the back of a shelter? That money flowed in. You know, I had all of these advantages that very few organizations have, which is why I say yes so often, because I feel obligated to share what I've had the privilege of learning. So again, that's a big part of what, I, what the, my own ability to think and ponder what kind of leader do I want is, is very much a byproduct of the fact that money come, came to me, opportunities came to me, microphones came to me, leaders came to me. You know? and, and while a lot of it is the byproduct, I think, of a solid organization with lots of people participating, ultimately I had benefits many other didn't people. So that's a big part of, I think it's always important to talk about. Um, the voice of people, I'm, I'm always intrigued by this. And, and when we talk about LA Kitchen now, which I'm trying to unlearn everything I did in DC. I don't want to just plop something down and regurgitate the same thing. So I'm challenging our organization and a very small, dedicated team of people to constantly challenge each other. And we have a phrase within our organization called, I, I, it's bad truce. You know, and I think sometimes we're, we're unwitting, unwitting and bad peacekeepers of a bad truce in America. We've allowed a huge number of people to believe that they send, if they send a check to charity, we can fix the problem. And we haven't had the courage to challenge the larger society to see it's like, we can't fix anything. The only way it gets fixed is if we fix it. So that's one of the reasons I've always embraced a side-by-side -side structure. Instead of and volunteer serving the poor, which was the tradition I encountered, my thing was like, no, we were going to be side-by-side. -side. President of the United States, you know, someone in, in the shelter, we are equal citizens and we have a shared duty and obligation to work side-by-side -side to make it happen. But I'm really interested, particularly now with so many different communications, whether it's Twitter. You know, again, big policy in an organization. Can everybody tweet? Can everybody Instagram? Can everybody post on the website? Or does it have to be filtered? I'm mesmerized by how do we control? Like one of my own personal experiments, it's personal. I'm not the highest paid employee. I wasn't the highest paid employee in DC, nor am I in LA. My, as I like to say, man, my circumstances don't mandate it. And my, my leadership isn't derived from my paycheck. So it's, it's okay for me not to be the highest paid. I think it's a fun gauntlet to throw down because it's so counterintuitive. You know, I'm the CEO, I must be the highest paid. Where's that written? Why? So I, it's constantly, to the, I think one of your earlier points, it's like, it's that constant questioning. I love, I, I love the intense curiosity of leadership. It's like, why do I do that? Why did I say that? Do we have to do it that way? Is there another way? And so to me, I'm constantly unpacking things. And this is why, just so you know, I'm a walker. You know, by night I swill tequila. During the morning I walk. But walking really gives me a chance to, it's the inner Walden, man. You know, it just gives me a chance to, to think it through a little bit, you know, and, and, and ponder what kind of a leader am I going to be today? What kind of decisions? You know, it, it, gets, it resets my compass needle a little bit. We all have our different ways of doing it, but I urge you to find the place where you can find your kind of inner pond and, and ponder almost on a daily basis, man, how am I going to roar out into this world you know, and be an agent of the people um, and be a, a different kind of leader. So you're someone who's been able to maintain his, his passion for what he does and, and uh, for the larger purposes. Um, and you're a doer. Um, and I did want to pick up on this theme of reflection of your own Walden Pond, because we spoke this morning about, about, uh, uh, about Thoreau. 
What is that role of reflection, and do you take advantage of that opportunity? Constantly. Now, I'm, I'm a flawed human, man. I mean, half the time I'm, I'm forgiving my enemies and letting it all go, and on the way back I'm plotting their death again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wish I could let go of, of some of the, you know, I still, uh, too often in my own thing, I need a foil. I need, I need a nemesis. I need to be against something to find my sense of place. And that's probably not productive, but I still, sadly, at age 57, need to have a nemesis. Um, and it might be, you know, a, a, a way, the nonprofit sector in the way we think. You get my point. But no, I'm a big believer in constant evaluation. Uh, and to me, again, it's, I've also been really lucky, uh, and I urge you if you get the opportunity in your life, um, I've been married 31 years, man. Um, and uh, I, I work hard. I'm a flawed man, man, but I work hard uh, at being a good husband. Uh, and my wife and I have champagne Friday date night, every Friday night. We try and have champagne, and then we take turns chasing each other around the house. Um, <laughs> but I mean, again, this is the, the point of it, though, is, you know, friends, the friends you all make here, man, and out there, you know, the friends you all make, don't underestimate the necessity of friends, the power of marrying a friend, but also nurturing those friendships. Because there's going to be time in each of your lives where you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be up against it, you know? And you'll need somebody to help you realize that you still have that power within you. You are still the badass, you know, you were here in Aspen. And those are the people you were here with. And they won't be there unless you're there for them, you know? And it's, and it's more than just liking Facebook stuff. And it's more than just stuff. But it's, it's, it's an honest attempt to be a good friend, you know? So again, in all your relationships, everything can become stale if you allow it. Your job, your leadership, your love can all become stale unless you work at it every single day. So I just urge you, think about that really hard, man. The friend you are, the spouse, if you're lucky enough to find a great partner. You know? But again, 49-51, I'm 51% to us, 49 to me. So I, I want to thank Robert Egger, but I also want to thank each of the fellows of the MX uh, Aspen program, because uh, you really, really enriched this conversation. So for those who want to say a word about the quality of the, 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 the conversation, but the questions and the comments, um, again, it's hashtag MX Leads, uh, it's at Robert Egger and at Jane Wales. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.